Hello, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. My name is Jimmy Smith of the Wine with Jimmy channel. Thank you so much for stopping by. So this is an educational channel on YouTube for things like the WSET certificates. Um, I run a huge amount of educational videos to help students gain confidence in order to pass their exams. Um, I run a separate uh, website, which is called www.winewithjimmy.com, which has an e-learning portal on it, which is a wonderful thing to subscribe to in order to gain that confidence for your examinations. Lots of things like multiple choice questions, flashcards, short written answer questions, revision sessions, and of course, lots of exclusive video content like this. This is one of my three videos that we have up on YouTube, but there is a whole host more which is only available to members of my e-learning portal. Uh, as always, if any of you have comments, questions or concerns, please do get in touch. You can do so via commenting on this video below. You can get in touch via the social media that you see at the bottom of every slide. And also you can get in touch via the website Wine with Jimmy. And thank you so much for so much of your feedback. It's been wonderful to hear so much, uh, so much praise for these sessions that we are creating here at Wine with Jimmy. Okay, so on this session, it uh, is part of the section called Wine Production. So this is unit one, D1 of the Diploma WSET level four. And this section is on hazards, pests and diseases. Now hazards, uh, no doubt you've already looked at. This is the first session of the pests part of this. And we are looking at, of course, this in front of us. It's not the most beautiful thing to have holding as a screen here, but this is a microscopic, microscopic version of phylloxera. So we're going to be talking about the uh, aphid-like louse called phylloxera, which of course has really shaped the global wine industry in the last couple of hundred years. It's one very big contributing factor to what, why certain things happen in the vineyard. So we're going to talk through um, actually quite a substantial amount of history because I believe that the story of phylloxera is actually something of a page turner. It's not just a, um, a factual scientific journal about this little bug that nearly wiped out the world of wine, certainly in Europe. Uh, but there's actually a real wonderful story behind it that spans a multitude of decades. And it's wonderful to get into that. So I will go through that uh, with you. And that's what's pretty much on the next slide you'll see here. So I'm going to go through a few slides of history, which outline some of the key moments that led up to phylloxera during the first sort of breakout of phylloxera uh, and how it was dealt with in France and then anything post that as well. Uh, we'll talk about, of course, exactly what is phylloxera um, and what, uh, what it does, how it spreads and the effect it has on the Vitus vinifera vine. We'll talk about how you can spot it as well, how, how it uh, affects the vines um, and how you can um, spot the symptoms of phylloxera. And then, of course, the management of it, how uh, we have, as a race have adapted uh, to combat against phylloxera. Okay, so they're the main things that we are going to look at in this presentation. Let's talk a little bit about history, first of all. So we have to cast our minds back quite far, nearly 200 years, in order to really understand how the emergence of phylloxera happened. So here we have a date for you. This is 1830. So in the 1830, there was the innovative and creative possibilities of transporting living plants, uh, and that's via transoceanic transport. So on ships, for instance, but in conditions where those living plants would survive. And we have people like James Busby importing plants from Montpellier uh, via, um, via London, all the way to uh, New South Wales, to Australia. Uh, we also have Nathaniel Ward, who created what's known as the Wardian case, the Wardian case, allowing that transoceanic um, uh, transport. And also coupled with the creation of uh, steam engine ships that actually could traverse, uh, say, the Atlantic in around 15 days, it made those journeys much shorter. 
So basically, we have now the ability to transport living plants very easily. Um, before this, it was very difficult. And of course, any anything uh, around the Americas, which were undiscovered at that time, of course, were not coming into Europe before this date because it was too difficult to, to transport them. Then we have 1845 hitting. Um, and here we have something called late blight. So actually, before the onset of phylloxera, we have something which is called late blight. That was the initial name given to it. Today it's called oidium, uh, or, or sometimes you would might, might hear it referred to as powdery mildew. And this m comes from uh, America. This is a, a parasitic fungus from America that um, traveled across, uh, you know, with these early uh, sea journeys, quick sea journeys across the oceans, across the seas, and started to feast their attention upon Europe. Um, by 1855, 10 years later, with this onset of uh, powdery mildew or late blight or oidium, they started to combat uh, this with powdered sulfur. So spraying powdered sulfur, which was a, um, a, a chemical, chemical that was readily available, uh, and was being used in other horticultural and agricultural circles. So they started to use that and it actually proved quite successful. It's important to mention this because in fact, sulfur was uh, the immediate first kind of, well, part of the first response. And we'll talk about that in a second in terms of combating phylloxera when it came, because it was successful against oidium or late blight or, or powdery mildew. Of course, um, uh, other grape growers and vignerons would turn to this sulfur in order to sort of protect their vines. So um, another thing happened as well. So there began a general import of American vines to combat oidium around 1860. Uh, another way to sort of protect their vines uh, if the sulfur was not so readily available in certain areas. But it was the beginning of the import. This is not mass import at this point. It's just interesting to note that this is the first stages of the American vines coming quickly across the Atlantic and landing in France, for example. And of course, this opens the door for phylloxera. So here we are, oh, that opening of the door. So in 1862, uh, Monsieur Borti started to um, plant a vineyard in the place called Roquemore in the Gare Departement. Uh, so this is in South France, and those vines were imported from New York, uh, and he planted it within a walled vineyard, like a clough. So these American vines, almost like a curiosity, I suppose, at that time, and that was 1862. By 1865, the vines that surrounded this walled vineyard started to wither and started to perish, uh, and unbeknown to uh, Monsieur Borti, he did not know what was going on at that point, um, but many people could start to make the connection between this um, surviving walled vineyard of American vines and then the dying surrounding vines. So something was not quite going right. Um, but slightly before the uh, French vines started to die away, we started to experience in other parts of Europe blistering of the lees, uh, which would later be called galling of the lees or galling of the lees. So we'll show you pictures of that later on, but this was noticed in a nursery in Hammersmith, and that's in West London in the United Kingdom. So strange, strange blisters were uh, found, uh, and in 1867, the same was appearing in some vineyards around Cheshire, and even some vines within Ireland as well uh, was succumbing to this blistering of the leaves. Um, and of course, in the meantime, the, the spread of what was happening in south of France, which began in the Garde Departement, started to spread across most of the south of France, and it became a very worrisome point. Um, by 1868, that you can see there, swarms of insects were found on exhumed vines near saint Remy in the south of the Rhône, uh, quite a famous place uh, today. Lots of uh, very famous people have houses in saint Remy. 
including winged forms of phylloxera. So the, the winged forms of the, uh, of the louse. Uh, and this was spearheaded by a man called Professor Blanchon, uh, who really was one of the main first um, ambassadors for the grafting method uh, in terms of protecting against phylloxera. Um, Professor Victor Signoret is the man who named it Phylloxera vasterix, uh, which actually means the dry leaf devastator. So that's your last point down there. Uh, and around 1869, the first attempts at destroying this Phylloxera vasterix, this winged form and all its other forms, was carried out with carbon bisulfide and all associated sulfur products. And this was in many shapes of forms, including uh, injecting these quite volatile compounds into the soils to try and blow up the bug. But of course, this would end up quite dramatically affecting the landscape as well. And in fact, many people lost their lives handling very volatile compounds to try and uh, compete and destroy against the phylloxera. So it became a very serious issue. So in the space of just under a decade, we have uh, vineyards, the livelihood of a very farmer-based industry in France, absolutely collapsing. Uh, and so the French Imperial Ministry of Agriculture offers 30,000 francs as a reward for anybody who would be able to come up with the solution to uh, eradicate phylloxera. And this actually by 1874, so four years later, would be increased tenfold to 300,000 francs. Uh, and um, then following that, so in fact, during that time, 1870 to 1874, the um, attempts of uprooting vineyards. So imagine that you were witnessing a very slow spread of this um, destruction of vines. So they would outline the movement of it. They would then uproot vineyards in the vicinity uh, and burn them. Uh, and hopefully this would stop the spread and contain the spread. But unfortunately, this was not successful. So burning, uprooting and burning attempts were not successful. Then in 1872, we have outbreaks in the Douro Valley in northern Portugal, in Austria, in Crimea. Uh, and by 1874, 73, 74, in California, in Germany and in Spain at this time. Uh, and then we have the mass import of American vines beginning because we really have we have what is known as, a, a, of, of course, a huge uh, disparity. We have very little amounts of French wine being produced during these years. And of course, the French needing to produce something. So importing American vines to plant them. Um, and hopefully you would have a, a, a success story because the European vines, of course, was succumbing to what was happening across the landscape. In 1875, um, grafting experiments. So the first grafting experiments of a vitis vinifera onto an American rootstock proved quite successful, and that showed quite a lot of promise. Uh, and then carbon bisulfide, so the original, um, the original sort of approach of uh, trying to blow up phylloxera was used on a much greater industrial scale because it was seen as the very quick short-term fix, but it wasn't hugely successful. Within um, uh, France at this time emerges two groups of professionals. You have what are called the sulfurists, so those that believe in the chemical cure for phylloxera, and then those called the Amer Americanists, those that believe that um, the American vines, though are likely to be the culprit, they are also likely to be the savior. But of course, this, this caused a lot of lobbying between these two groups because one believed they were much more correct than the other, of course. We then have uh, outbreaks in 1875 in Hungary and also in Australia, in, uh, in, the, um, in Victoria, around uh, Geelong in the southern area. Then we have, in 1878, the Agreement of Bern. 
This is on the communication a communication of infestation across Europe. So um, making sure that our areas were identified that were infested with phylloxera uh, and then the illegal transport of uh, any kind of rootstocks or vine, uh, vine wood, uh, it was not allowed during these times. So you would basically create quarantine zones. Um, Italy also experienced its first April outbreak in 1879. Um, by this time, the Americanists, uh, those that believe in grafting onto American rootstocks, were, were winning much more so or gaining momentum than the sulfurists because the sulfur, uh, in terms of the carbon bisulfide, was not, used, not working so well. So there were state license, licensed nurseries established in the Midi region uh, that were allowed to begin rootstock grafting. And in 1881, the Americanists defeat the sulfurists in a phylloxera congress of Bordeaux. Um, but interestingly, uh, you have basically the Americanists saying, yes, the American rootstock is going to be the savior. But wine had been reduced at this point from vines grafted onto American rootstocks but those Americanists on the panel refused to taste these wines at this Congress. Uh, so interesting, even though they saw it as the way forward, they probably were not happy about it, but something had to be done. And in 1887, uh, so we're looking a little bit later, um, we're looking at the establishment of American vines now, but the problem being is that American vines, so even if this is Vitis vinifera grafted purely onto American rootstocks, both at fully American vines and then European uh, Vitis vinifera grafted onto American rootstocks, what you've basically got there is the full American vine has American rootstocks and then the, uh, the crossing, uh, or rather the grafted vine, also has an American rootstock. And those American rootstocks begin to struggle, though they show signs of struggle in the very European chalky soils, so very high alkaline soils with high lime content. Um, they're not used to it and they're not, they're not very good at surviving in those uh, conditions. So widespread spread chlorosis happens. So widespread chlorosis happens due to the unsuitability of the American rootstocks in European chalk soils. So this is just, mind you, the chalk-based soils at this time. Um, but then we have a, um, a man called Pierre Viala, and Pierre Viala travels to Texas in order to find resistant vines that will grow in chalky soils. Uh, and by 1888, large scale, um, uh, large scale importing of the Bolanderi um, rootstock and vine from Texas begins. And that goes into Cognac region at that time. Phylloxera reaches Champagne in 1893. Um, and for the first time, though, by this time, we, we're now getting um, more grafting onto American rootstock. So vines, some production is happening, despite the fact that they're not always widely suited to chalky soils. You've still got things like sandy soils, clay-based soils. You've still got things like volcanic soils and so on. So um, they actually record for the first time in 15 years levels of production in France which would match pre-phylloxera. So they had had a huge loss of wine production for 15 years due to phylloxera, but now with these innovative techniques, they are starting to produce a decent size crop again. Um, by 1900, pretty much all of France was declared phylloxerated, meaning it's all under the influence of phylloxera. But of course, by this time, there was widespread movement, not only for utilizing American vines or American rootstocks, but, but the hybridization of rootstocks, which we'll talk about later. So the hybridization between um, European and American uh, vine species to create rootstocks, which are both tolerant of phylloxera, but also at the same time, uh, are tolerant of these very high alkaline lime soils. Um, so um, more innovation and creation. 
Um, and a lot later, uh, going in towards the end of the 20th century, century California uh, succumbs uh, again to this aphid. Uh, and that is basically because a new biotype of the aphid phylloxera was discovered in St. Helena. And the rootstocks, uh, which is called AXR1, which were recommended by the UC Davies of California, proved very, very poor against this biotype of phylloxera. So uh, once again, a big out, uh, a, a big spread and outbreak within California, which had to end up in replantation, certainly of the AXR1 rootstock. And uh, there's been outbreaks recently because there are parts of the world which are phylloxera free. Some of these would be phylloxera free due to the fact that the geology or maybe the topography, the altitude, it just does not support phylloxera. Uh, so sandy soils, for example, or volcanic soils um, with high altitude uh, does not support often phylloxera. But also areas in the world that phylloxera has never made it to due to uh, very good um, quarantine laws, uh, but also natural protections of boundaries of mountains and seas. Um, and Australia is one of those with very strict laws. So phylloxera, um, not really that prevalent in Australia, but in 2019, so very recently, um, there was an outbreak in near the St Andrews area of the Yarra Valley in Australia. Uh, which, uh, of course, caused a, a great worry. And there's been small outbreaks in places like Chile as well. So so there we go. That's the kind of history of phylloxera. I know that's quite a long amount, but I think it's a fascinating story, which really shows you uh, the challenges that France initially uh, really had to face and then how they dealt with it through time. So now let's talk about uh, exactly what phylloxera is, what it does, and how we can manage against it. So as I mentioned, phylloxera is an aphid-like insect that feeds on and lays eggs on the roots of grape vines. And this is Vitis vinifera. It is very keen on Vitis. And of course, it's very damaging to Vitis vinifera. Uh, so um, these almost microscopic, pale, yellowy, orange, sap-sucking insects um, that are related to aphids, as I mentioned, feed on the roots and also leaves of grapevines. And it depends on the specific, uh, the specific um, phylloxera genetic strain about exactly what it does. Um, but they are, uh, of course, therefore um, utilizing the root as something to feed on. And it's the damage they do to it which really causes the problem. So here is the effect. Okay. So it weakens vine roots and causes swelling and cracks, which lead to rot. Uh, so it feeds on the vitis species. We talked about that. It's particularly fond of vitis vinifera, but all vitis, so the vine species. Um, it infests the root system. You'll see the picture on the right there. Um, that is what we would classify as an infestation, a huge amount swarming upon the, uh, the root, for example. But it also is the leaves, and you see that on the picture on the left-hand side just there. Uh, and it's known as uh, cecidiogenic, which means gall. Um, so here are the great, great phylloxera galls or gals, and these are, um, these are the what formed by phylloxera in the leaf, for example. Okay, I believe the gestation happens in the leaf and then eggs are dropped to the ground. Uh, and, but that can infestation and uh, that can also happen in the roots as well. So, okay, so it's it, the picture on the last um, one we saw was a little, um, a little aphid, which doesn't seem like it's going to be able to spread quite far, right? It's a very small microscopic thing, which is going to take millennia to get from point A to point B in the world. So how the hell has it spread? Well, um, we know that it uh, today, we know a lot about it. We know that it can crawl, uh, but that's not huge distances. But then we have the flying winged version, which of course can cover much great, greater distances. But also you've got to remember it's the influence of humans. We have, um, taken this little aphid-like creature out of its uh, natural habitat by uprooting the plants where it was known to originally reside and then bring them to places in other parts of the world, such as Europe. 
And of course, that's how it managed to cross the Atlantic. It crossed the Atlantic in the root systems of pre-existing vines which were brought across to Europe. Uh, so it hitched a free ride across the Atlantic on those steamships in the middle of the 19th century. Um, but uh, it's um, also brought in by um, equipment, leaf trimmers, harvesters as well, irrigation water. There's many other methods that it can spread as well. So what are the symptoms then? So we've got a few things up here uh, on this slide. So vines will die of drought in patches that increase in size and size by the year. And that's basically because what we mentioned it, that phylloxera does on the previous slide is that it goes along the root and then it, it, it gets its little pincers and it starts to pierce the root and it takes out, uh, it sucks up the nutrients and water that it can gain from that root system. Once it is finished and it moves on, that is a wound. That is a wound that is in that root system and that becomes infected and that becomes infected uh, with a lot of fungal molds and that increases the risk of rot. And of course that starts to rot the root system. When the root system rots, the root system is therefore um, really being disabled, it is being destroyed, and it's no longer uh, able to take up the nutrients and the water that it needs. So the vine starts to wither away. So above ground, it starts to wither away. It could be raining, it could be absolutely water drenched landscape. However, you're going to get vines dying because the root systems are not developed, they have died. So vines will die of drought. Also, the vines roots, as we mentioned, are covered with the insects with these yellowy eggs. Um, and uh, you'll normally find the insects covered in the around these uh, these yellow eggs. Of course, they're going to burst and there's going to be more phylloxera created. You may see swelling on older roots as a result and pale green leaf galls on the undersurface of the leaves, like in the picture we saw previously and this diagram that you have on the left hand side. So the underside of the leaf will show these little lesions, these galls that develop due to phylloxera. And then you're also going to get slow stunted shoot growth and also the yellowing of leaves, uh, uh, leaves because of the lack of nutrients that are being absorbed. And normally uh, around three to five years after being infested with phylloxera, the plant will die. OK, so it's pretty serious at that point. So what about managing phylloxera? And we've alluded to this because we talked through the history, but let's go through it now in a bit more of a structured way, in a less romantic and historical way. So first of all, the use of American vine species um, proved initially to be the way ahead, um, especially things like um, the one on the right hand side here. So Vitis uh, burlanderi. Uh, on the right hand side, a Vitis riparia on the left hand side just here, and Vitis rupestris, the second from the left on this slide. They offered the greatest amount of protection and tolerance against phylloxera. These species, specifically these three, form very hard, almost corky type layers uh, that surround the eggs, sealing the wounds and preventing invasion by bacteria or fungus. So it's really creating a protective system in order to protect it, the, the actual roots from losing its moisture, losing its nutrients and succumbing to fungal molded rot. Um, so the solution was to graft European varieties onto root rootstocks from American vines, of course. And there we are. So we began, as we mentioned earlier, the grafting of a scion and the scion is the Vitis vinifera, so that would be something like Chardonnay, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, and so on, and grafting that onto an American rootstock. But it was discovered that grafting onto the rootstock of a single American vine uh, would work against phylloxera, but it would cause problems 
specifically in the calcareous soils of Europe. So the limestone chalky soils of, of Europe. And this is not all of Europe, as I mentioned earlier, but places like Champagne, Chablis, Burgundy, the Loire Valley, Bordeaux, parts of Rioja, Catalonia. There's lots of places in Europe which once was covered by a very large shallow lake, a lake millions of years ago uh, and were deposited uh, all of these kind of crustacean bones over all this sea life. And that created the limestone based soils that we have, the very chalk laden soils. So the American single American rootstock was good against phylloxera, but poor in these chalky based soils. And with a lot of grape growers in France finding their vineyards on chalk, of course, you could bet your bottom franc, uh, franc that you were going to get a, um, a big group here pressuring to find another way out of this because it was not working perfectly for them. Um, so, of course, those vines which were in these um, limestone chalky soils that had American rootstocks would suffer from chlorosis, turning the leaves yellow, so having a lack of nutrients, uh, reducing photosynthesis and reducing yields. So the next solution was what we also mentioned in the historical part as well. The solution was, of course, to create rootstock hybrids. So not single American rootstocks, but rootstock hybrids. And that's between the various American species, such as uh, Riparia rupestris bilanderi, uh, and also the, um, and then vitis type rootstocks. And that's in order to balance the level of protection of phylloxera and the resistance to the lime in these chalky soils. Um, so the use of rootstocks derived from American species enabled the development of a multitude of rootstocks, often with quite complex parentage that could deal with a huge wide spectrum of problems. So there's various benefits because they will deal with problems, of course, like phylloxera, but also things like nematodes, the microscopic worms that we find in soils. Uh, extra, extreme soil pH, uh, water stress, salinity of the soil, the salt levels, and also controlling vigor of the vine. So today there is a huge business out there regarding these hybridizations of the rootstocks and in terms of which rootstocks will be better for you. So nurseries today that are very skilled um, will give professional advice to uh, grape growers on the suitable rootstocks for their site, bringing into consideration, of course, soil analysis, you know, understanding what kind of soil it is, the drainage capabilities, the vigor that will come from it, the pH of the soil, and many other key, uh, key considerations. Um, now, planting on rootstocks is significantly more expensive uh, than on its vi own vine roots, because of course you have to um, purchase these vines that have gone through quite an extensive nursery program, but it really has become a very standardized part of the cost today. It is factored into establishing vineyards because the protection against phylloxera is nearly always considered around the world uh, due to the fact that it is quite widespread, of course, around the world today. OK, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this video on the beginning section of pests in the hazards, pests and diseases part of the diploma unit one for the WSET level four. Um, thank you so much for your time. If you do have any comments, questions or concerns, then please, you can get in touch via the comment section on this YouTube video that's just below. Please make sure you hit subscribe for more videos like this and also the social media that you see at the bottom of every slide. Um, also, if you are um, wanting to experience all of the other videos in this section, so all the other videos about pests such as nematodes, for example, and all the ones within hazards and diseases, plus all of the other countless videos, there are many, many exclusive videos only for my e learning portal subscribers. So you need to go over to west, uh, sorry, to uh, winewithjimmy.com. That's www.winewithjimmy.com. And you can subscribe 
and you'll get access to a lot of extra content which will help you with your, your quest and your journey through the WSET Level 4 syllabus. So thank you again. If you do find yourself in London, come and see me. As you know, I've got wine schools and wine bars. So come and see us for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you so much. Thank you.